Hi, I'm Laura Flanders. For a few weeks after the election of a new mayor last fall, New Yorkers crammed into a tent downtown and shared their hopes and dreams for the new administration. And their gripes, of course, too. Now, people everywhere here, as in other cities, are watching their governments get down to business and wondering, after the voting, after the speaking out and the rallying, what can we, regular people, do, especially poor people do, to influence what happens next? Ana Maria Archila is executive director of the Center for Popular Democracy, and she has a few tips. Ana Maria, welcome to the program. <laughs> Thank you so much. I loved the transition tent. It was a really, really um, beautiful and exciting expression of what New Yorkers were feeling at the time, immediately after the election, after 12 years of a government that seemed so disconnected from the lives of working class people, to just see this kind of beautiful structure that um, exemplified kind of a, a, the aspiration of a transparent government, an open government. Uh, and a very vibrant government. Who showed up for people that weren't there? It was an enormous mix as far as I could see. Well, I can tell you that when I went to the talking transition tent, I saw hundreds and hundreds of people from all over the city, working class New Yorkers of all colors, immigrants, mothers, young people, uh, really coming to both share what, they, what their dreams and their aspirations and their expectations were for the new mayor, um, and to build community with other New Yorkers who were also coming to do the same thing. Now, I told all my friends, look, here's the evidence that people really want to participate in government. Here's the evidence that people have a lot to say that's not being heard. And they all said, yeah, but what's going to happen to everything that they said? How is, is any of this stuff going to get implemented? Um, here's what Bill de Blasio, the mayor, mm -hmm. had to say at the tent. And he makes the point mm -hmm. that some of the best ideas won't be coming from him. I think a lot of times the best solutions are grassroots solutions. And I experienced this as a city council member, I experienced this as public advocate. A lot of times you would hear from an everyday New Yorker an idea that literally never came up in any policy seminar or any briefing. Uh, and you have to be open to that. So I think some of the power of talking transition is that it sort of opens the gates of city government, and lets everyone come in with their ideas, with their uh, insights. And it, yeah, it'll be a lot of data. But I think we're going to find some very powerful ideas in it. That was Bill de Blasio at the transition tent. There mm -hmm. he says it. Some of the best ideas come from the grassroots. Is he implementing those ideas so far or trying to? Well, I think he has already done at least one. Um, I know that when Make the Road New York, the organization that I um, helped kind of create um, and my, my organizing home, when Make the Road New York came to the tent, we were, at, we were presenting four very concrete ideas of what the new mayor could do to improve the lives of low-wage workers. One of them was expanding uh, the paid sick days legislation to make sure that more workers were covered. Um, another one was making sure that the city could control its ability to raise wages um, and others. And Mayor de Blasio already, as one of his first initiatives, expanded the paid sick day legislation in New York City. So I feel like he was listening, but he's only listening because New Yorkers are incredibly organized and low wage workers in particular are rising up and demanding more. New Yorkers are demanding more. And the Center for Popular Democracy is part of that. But I'm not 100% clear about everything that you do. You said your organizing home is still with Make the Road. But the Center for Popular Democracy is, democracy is where you are now. Yes. So just a few months ago, I made the transition from Make the Road New York, uh, the place where I learned the ropes of organizing and where I found kind of my, my roots in the movement for social and economic justice and um, started a new role as the co-executive director of the Center for Popular Democracy, which is the sister national organization of Make the Road New York. And the Center for Popular Democracy is really designed to be a hub of support for community organizers across the country. Um, and we offer a series of kind of capacities to expand the, the power, the strength, the sophistication of organizers and community organizations in the country. We have a really excellent policy team, a really excellent research team, a team that's helping build organizations and a team that's helping lead and kind of lead campaigns. But so our work is really to magnify the, the efforts that are happening on the ground. So what would you say are the key issues that people in organizations uh, regionally and locally are, are, are tackling? Well, one thing that we're seeing and that's incredibly exciting is uh, really 
workers are rising, low wage workers who have been kind of outside of the of the kind of traditional union structures are organizing in different forms, worker centers, um, just worker associations of different sorts, um, and are demanding, are organizing and demanding policy changes, very concrete. In New York City, we're seeing paid sick days as one of those fights, and inc demanding an increase to the minimum wage is another of those fights. Um, so I think across the country we're seeing kind of a revitalized workers movement that looks more, uh, looks less like a kind of traditional union and more like what the kind of labor movement used to look in the 20s and 30s where entire communities were demanding dignity and respect. Um, we're also seeing really um, kind of exciting ideas about what governments, local governments can do to recover some of the kind of the money of the people. So in New York, for example, People are presenting ideas to the new mayor about how to manage pension funds in a different way, how to uh, make sure that banks and corporations really pay their fair share. And then we're also seeing parents and young people organizing to demand kind of um, a real attention to the crisis of education. So, you know, Mayor de Blasio has a very important idea to expand access to pre-K. Um, young people in this city also have really important ideas about how to stop the kind of the the school to prison pipeline by changing the discipline policies that our city has. Now the question becomes, you know, how does this work maintain itself at a time when all the messages are leave it to government now? Um, mm -hmm. I had a chance to interview Letitia James, the public mm -hmm. advocate here in New York, Tish. And I asked her about how does this momentum carry on? People had high expectations of Obama, too. And mm -hmm. then when he came into office, they kind of cooled off, hoping that he would take over. She said, right. don't have an Obama slump. Oh, <laughs> definitely not, I, especially now. Um, I think that we know that the change in the politics of New York City would not have happened had it not been for the hundreds and thousands of New Yorkers who were organizing to really build a different environment, to say the, the way that our city is policed is, is, is a vile, it kind of takes away our, our dignity. The way that our economy is working takes away this idea of opportunity. So, um, so I think in cities um, and in some states, Community organizations are playing are playing a really vital role well, so in changing the politics. How how are they doing it? Are they camping out in people's offices? What are they doing? Well, I think that first, communities have built institutions that are resilient. So you can look at um, domestic workers, kind of organizing in different states. The domestic workers organizations didn't really exist 15 years ago. Right. This is kind of a a new form. Um, you can also see taxi workers and restaurant workers and other types of workers forming organizations. I think one really important way in which uh, we can ensure that um, that our democracy really becomes more real is by creating inst community institutions that are internally democratically accountable to real people and that are resilient and, and that are expanding kind of power by associating more and more people. Um, I think also there are new formations nationally that allow um, community, communities to really kind of gain from each other. And you can look at the, the dreamers, right? 15 years ago, there was nothing. The, the immigrant rights movement looked very different from what it does today. Um, I think young pe the role that young people have played in kind of transforming the immigration debate um, is really exemplary of what can happen, but they also have been able to do it by building an organization that uh, that is increasingly kind of so more sophisticated and able to drive an agenda. No, I'm not Glenn Beck, and I'm not going to say this has all been done by um, rich liberal donors, but there's been a lot of foundations who've played a role in this. Are the organizations that you're talking about building the kind of sustainability they need when the foundations mm -hmm. do what they always do, which is at some point change their priorities? Well, I think that's actually a really big problem in our field uh, of community organizing. Um, most community organizations are really quite dependent on foundations. Um, the Center for Popular Democracy is taking this problem very, very seriously because we want to make sure that we're building a robust infrastructure um, that really is able to kind of express and use and advance uh, kind of grassroots power in the um, to you know, get a better economy and, and win racial justice. And in order to do that, we need organizations that are more resilient. I can tell you that Make the Road New York is kind of 
piloting a really interesting model of a partnership between Make the Road New York and um, a credit union to enable Make the Road New York members to pay their membership dues and also build uh, kind of credit histories and banking histories with a non-predatory institution. So that's one way in which um, we're actually trying to resolve the mechanics mm. of actually raising money from the Bay, raising sources and really sustaining our organizations from the base. Um, I think, you know, some organizations used to do this really well. Acorn actually, back in the day, really had figured out how to create kind of sustaining organizations that were owned in, in a very real way by the members and that knowledge has been kind of lost. So we're trying to, uh, to figure out the mechanics again. Because member dues alone probably won't do it because you're dealing with low-income people for the most part. Mm -hmm. Any other sort of smart ideas? Well, so I think that the issue of member dues is really important, partly because when you look at who, how, the kind of, uh, the charity do and giving in the U.S., the reality is that most of it, like 60% of it, is by is in the form of small donations by individuals that give to their church, that give to kind of their favorite charity. The old tithing model. The, right. But it's the kind of the progressive infrastructure, the field of community organizing has not taken that challenge seriously. So we need to do that. Uh, but I think we also need to think about new ways of... Um, kind of ex ways of building kind of revenue generation that uh, are also examples of new forms of kind of economic relationships. So some organizations are experimenting with, um, with cooperatives. Rock New York in New York City had its own restaurant of restaurant owned workers. by the workers. So I think there are different experiments um, and all of those are really exciting. Um, we need to obviously figure out kind of the pilots and then figure out how to bring those experiments to scale. And are there government policies at the local or regional or, or state level that could help some of these initiatives? When you look, for example, at New York City and you see the ways in which workforce development monies are invested, they're totally devoid from the reality of what's happening on the ground. Um, you could uh, have a government that more closely aligns workforce mm -hmm. uh, policies with uh, the goal of promoting economic opportunity. Um, but there are, in some way, the biggest cooperative that we have is our own government, and we need to make it work for us. So we need to make sure that uh, the city, the cities and states are using their power to raise wages. We need to make sure that cities and states are using their power to make corporations pay uh, their fair share of taxes. We need to make sure that uh, people who have more actually contribute a proportional share of what they benefit. From. So um, I think we need to kind of look at our government as our institution and the institution that we want to make work for us. That's our biggest cooperative. For our Commonomics column at um, Yes Magazine, I'm curious about mm -hmm. your definition of a strong local economy. What makes a strong local economy? I think a strong local economy is one in which uh, we uh, use the the rules that we share, the laws that we share to promote economic opportunity. So you can look at economies, I mean, local uh, cities that have uh, really used their power to raise wages, right? You can look at Seattle, you could look at some of the examples of, of how governments have done that. Um, a, an economy where young people are actually on the path to opportunity and not to a dead-end job. Uh, in New York City, we really have to tackle the problem of, of uh, kind of a dead-end educational system um, and an economy where families can live lives that are uh, self-sustaining. Um, you know, and when we look at New York City and the grow the types of industries that are growing in New York City, retail and service industries, um, we have an extreme part the kind of the part-timeization of, of jobs. Um, that's a problem that government can resolve by requiring that people uh, you know, that, that employers in the retail industry have a minimum number of hours, that, uh, you know, all the workers get paid, paid sick days, that people have family leaves. These kinds of policies, I think, make the economy stronger, make families more resilient, make communities uh, more productive. And are responsive to the levers of government if we just figure out how to push and pull them. That's absolutely right. You know, in our mainstream media, money media, I call it, we hear a lot about immigration as a problem. But mm -hmm. every community organizer I talk to, every labor organizer I talk to says 
problem. What we are getting from the latest wave of immigrants are ideas, know-how, and a familiarity with organizing that, in fact, seems as if it's been lost to some mm -hmm. extent in the United States. Is that what you find? Yeah, I mean, just on the issue of the kind of the contributions of uh, immigrants to the economy, you can just look at New York City's economy and the reality that most of the New York City's kind of economic activity uh, really happens in small businesses. And the bigger, the biggest kind of driver of small business creation is immigration um, in New York City alone. So there's the um, money part, but it's not just the money. It's not just the money, that's right. I think community um, community organizing as a field has really been transformed by the kind of immigrant rights organizing that has happened over the last 20 years. Um, people come from traditions from other parts of the world that see kind of how radical it is to actually win services, how radical it is to create kind of infrastructures of support that are owned and controlled by people. And I think you have seen a kind of a revitalization of, of organizing um, in, in ways that are really, really exciting and that move away from some of the kind of do dogmas that um, I think made organizing kind of um, dry for, mm -hmm. for a long time in this country. What's happening today is we're in kind of immigrants are as a as a force in our country are are really um, transforming the politics of cities of of states of our, of our nation, but also really um, moving us in the direction of being kind of the America that that we want to be, an America that uh, is incredibly diverse and that is uh, incredibly welcoming. What's your take on? localism. A lot of people think the solution is the local solution, whether you're talking local economy, local production, local organizing. Um, you've gone from a local organization to one that's working on the national stage. Is mm -hmm. that reflective of a ideological shift? Or, or what do you think of the sort of discourse around the local these days? When I think about the work that I did over the last 13 years at Make the Road New York, I think the value of it is that we were able to build an organization that had deep roots in real neighborhoods, in real communities. And I think that's just, that's really what's valuable about organizing in the country. I think moving to the Center for Popular Democracy is really an effort to try to figure out how to link the different local knowledges um, and create kind of connective tissue that enables our movement to be stronger and more powerful. Um, but at the same time, it's people, like our world, you know, when you look at the people that are living in Queens, they have histories that go, that have their roots in other parts of the world. And so we're both local and incredibly global. Um, and uh, just figuring out how to build organizations that are able to kind of live that reality and use that reality. What do you do when, we, when you leave here? What's your next agenda item or your top priority? I think that with the kind of election of the new mayor and the reorganizing of the, of the city council, uh, we have the opportunity to really push through some really exciting um, kind of initiatives on workers' rights on um, education, on racial justice. I think the conversation that is happening around policing in the city is incredibly valuable. Um, also because it's just putting race back in the, kind of in the consciousness of people and in the, um, kind of in the consciousness of government. Yeah. So I, I am kind of very excited to figure out how to contribute to that in New York. I think that, I guess, as I think about the work that I've done over the last 13 years, a lot of it has been to build the immigrant rights movement from New York City uh, and to link with other parts of the country. Immigration reform, I think, is going to happen. And it will be an amazing opportunity to build organizations across the country. And I want to um, have real ideas and real kind of solutions to make sure that uh, community organizations in the country are able to take advantage of these opportunities. One thing cities are thinking about doing, and de Blasio has been asked to address, is this question of municipal IDs. Uh, how will that help, or will it help? Well, New York City is, um, is, a, is a, New York City shapes kind of the, the, the environment on nationally on many issues. Policing is one. Immigration is another, kind of the ability of government to promote uh, 
opportunity, economic opportunity is another. And I think municipal IDs getting uh, immigration enforcement agents out of the local correctional facilities, language access, all of these local policies um, really shape the conversation around immigration. And so uh, we're very, very excited that uh, Mayor de Blasio is actually kind of very proactively looking for ways in which New York City can help drive the conversation in the right direction. Um, and so I think municipal IDs will help that. Um, making sure that the city is prepared for uh, the event of immigration reform is, that, is another really, really important initiative um, that will also kind of focus the attention of other cities and other states on, the, on that opportunity. Great. Anna Maria, thank you so much. Keep up thank the you. great work. Thank you. Thank you.